Hey everybody, this is The Office Field Guide. I'm Chris, and I'm reviewing every episode of The Office ever. Today we're looking at the Benihana Christmas episode, which consistently ranks as one of the best Christmas episodes of The Office in all nine seasons. This episode first aired on December 14th, 2006. It was viewed by 8.4 million people, and it's currently rated 8.8 .8 out of 10 on IMDb. We have so much to talk about between the sheer enormous amount of background details in this episode, the deeper meaning, and a new segment I'm introducing in this field guide, so stay tuned. The Benihana Christmas episode was written by Jennifer Saletta, who wrote all of these episodes of The Office, as well as portrays one of Dwight's affiliates in the finale. And maybe one of the coolest background things about this episode is that it was actually directed by Harold Ramis. I have a lot of respect for this guy as he had his hand in a ton of things that I loved growing up. He also directed the safety training and beach game episodes in season three, as well as the delivery part two in season six. So Robert Schaefer actually told me this awesome story about bumping into Harold Ramis at one of the cast watch parties during an interview I had with him a couple months ago. I'll put the link in the description. It's definitely worth checking out. And the setup for the Benihana Christmas episode is that Carol breaks up with Michael for photoshopping himself onto an old vacation photo, and Michael makes another holiday celebration about himself. Could you for once just let us enjoy a party instead of making it about all your issues? And your Benihana trivia is, what color or colors does Angela think is whorish? I thought you said is whorish. No, just whorish. The answer will be right before the ratings. With that, let's dish this one up. No one uh, asked you anything ever. Okay, and so this is our first official hour-long episode in Office history. Since this is an hour long, there's a ton to talk about, so let's just dig in. First up, and maybe the most discussed aspect of this episode, at least from what I've witnessed myself online, is the Benihana Trio, or maybe foursome, but that sounds dirtier than I intended. So we're gonna go with Trio. The gist of it is that at the behest of Andy, Michael is flirting with this girl, but when they show up at the Christmas party, it's a completely different actress. Hey, where is everybody? I was wondering if maybe it was added commentary to the fact that Michael couldn't tell the difference between these waitresses. We're supposed to scoff at Michael's low-key racism. Meanwhile, we didn't realize that there were multiple actresses. But then I found an interview from 2007 in which Greg Daniels mentions that it was supposed to be a joke that flopped. The joke being that Michael and Andy failed at their initial attempts and settled for less attractive waitresses. Daniel said the joke flopped because all of the actresses were so pretty. So I'm not exactly sure what the truth of the matter is, but it's definitely one of my favorite memes around Christmas time. So let me know in the comments, did you notice the actress swapping on your first viewing? And so before we move on to any other aspect of this episode while we're still in the Benihana, there is a few things to call out. This couple is awful. I just can't believe in this situation, they didn't move. This is my PSA. Don't be like them. But this guy, he's been in a lot of stuff over the years, and this actress has also been in a lot of stuff, but for me, she was CJ something or other in Silicon Valley, a series that I love. And moving on, but still in the Benihana, Jim reneged pretty quickly on not pranking Dwight. Hold its neck back, insert the knife beneath the jaw, bring it all the way around. There's gonna be a good amount of blood. But it's cool, this cracks me up every single time. All right, so other callouts in this episode, the Photoshop card, I like to think that it's just Steve Carell's head photoshopped over an actual picture of Steve Carell's head with Nancy and their kids. But I haven't seen that confirmed anywhere. I did see that this card sold at auction back in 2008 to support the United Way. Sometimes I spend too much time volunteering. Occasionally I'll hit somebody with my car. It was sold alongside some clothing items worn in the show like Michael's lucky tie and also assigned Dwight Bobblehead. It's me. I'm the Bobblehead. There's potentially an interesting callback here between Dwight and Angela. And if we cut back to the pilot episode, Dwight is randomly lipping the little drummer boy. So maybe this weird little thing they have going on has been going on since before the pilot. And in a couple other hidden goodies, Creed is singing his own song, which is super meta. Okay, so in the gift exchange that Jim and Karen have, they give each other the Bridget Jones Diary sequel. It's actually an inside joke 
about how awful that movie is between Mindy Kaling and Michael Schur. I love inside jokes. Love to be a part of one someday. Okay, I think I hit everything I could call out in this episode. So with that, let's get to the deeper meaning. Why don't you explain this to me like I'm five? Okay, as this episode is an hour long, I think there's a lot that goes into it. And I keep saying hour long, and I really mean 42 minutes long. So if we were to break this into threes, the first third shows people wanting what they can't have. Dwight wants the goose. Michael wants to go to Jamaica with Carol. Pam wants things to go back to the way they were with Jim. And Toby wants a robe. Pretty nice robes, I guess. Why? Then around the 10 to 15 minute mark, it moves into this whole rivalry theme. Dwight and Andy are rivals for the number two position. They're also competing for Michael's attention. There's a bit of Stanford and Scranton rivalry happening. Clearly at least Pam realizes that there was some sort of competition between her and Karen, even if Karen didn't realize there was a competition. Then we move into the most obvious rival of the episode, which is the clash of the two parties. I love this metaphor when trying to force Stanley and the rest of the office to choose between two things. It's perfect imagery for what Jim is going to have to do at some point. And then still in this rivalry theme, Jim and Dwight have this exchange, which calls out their past conflicts. Permission to not. Jim, it. Jim and Ryan have this playful banter, which foreshadows their future conflicts. And Michael's bros or hoes bit would probably fall into this rivalry motif as well. Then suddenly she's not your hoe, no mo. And then as this episode resolves, the theme shifts again. It takes this tragically optimistic tone of resolving while knowing that not all is right. Toby gets the robe, but it's clear there's a lot more going on under the exteriors. And on that note, Kevin does get to escape the party. But again, there's definitely something going on under the surface here. You can see it in his performance. You, 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 you ought to know. And while we're talking about that song, the song he's singing is You Oughta Know by Alanis Morissette, which is about the fallout after a heartbreak. Michael finds temporary happiness with the Benihana waitress, but we're all just waiting for that to fall apart. Nah, I have school. Which it does, and it leads to this great sequence. <sighs> I guess I didn't know her very well. I marked her arm. But Michael's takeaway from this conversation is to ask Jan to go to Sandals with him. But we know where that's going to lead. Stip, stop, stip, stop, stip, stop! Jim's motives for getting involved with Karen in the first place are made a little bit more clear in this conversation with Michael. I don't think he necessarily even wanted to date Karen. He just started dating her in conjunction with moving back to Scranton. So he wouldn't have to face Pam as the same guy who left Scranton defeated. There's some pride and some heartbreak in his actions, and unfortunately for Karen, Jim's practically admitting here that she's just a rebound girl. When it's over, you're left thinking about the girl you really like. One that broke your heart. Though she's not the only victim to Jim's rebounds. Let's break up. Whoa, what? And I love the duality of Pam seeing Jim and Karen's gift exchange, and Jim seeing Pam and Roy's gift exchange. And still in this resolving but things not being right motif, Jim's back at pranking Dwight again. Abort mission, destroy phone. Destroy phone. And even Dwight and Angela have this great moment, but you know the way they're handling their relationship is gonna lead to disaster. And reveal our true love. It won't be that bad. Look at Kelly and Ryan. I hate those two people more than anything in the entire world. So pulling all this together into one coherent message is that sometimes you gotta jump through hurdles in life. You're gonna trip, you're gonna fall, you're gonna get messy, you're gonna get torn. And that life can suck until it doesn't. Maybe one year she'll be with somebody and the next year I'll be with somebody and it's gonna take a long time and then it's perfect. I'm in no rush. Or I don't know, maybe this whole episode exists to finally have someone stand up to Angela. Does anyone ever stand up to Angela? Or... I think one of her cats did once. She came in with scratches all over her face. <laughs> right. That reminds me, I'm adding my new segment to the field guides today. It's called Episodes That We Were Robbed Of. Basically, the premise is 
based on this episode, what events had to have happened that we never saw. So for example, a few episodes ago, I mentioned that it would have been great to see an episode dedicated to Michael and Dwight creating Lazy Scranton. So the episode that we were robbed of from the Benihana Christmas episode is called The Duel, in which Angela and Phyllis's party planning committee goes to full out war against Pam and Karen's committee to plan parties. I love the arc in this episode, and I think we were robbed of another episode drawing it out and showing Karen and Pam's friendship develop, making the eventual moment that Karen finds out about Jim's former crush on Pam carry a lot more weight. So glad you were Jim. He was hung up on Pam for such a long time. I didn't think he'd ever get over her. And this has been the episode we were robbed of. I'm not sure where I'm going to put this segment in the future, but leave a comment if you can think of any other episodes that we were robbed of. But with that, let's dish out some dundies. And then I gotta get them to the dundies. Okay, so since Creed Bratton is so meta in this episode, I'm going to follow suit. The tallest music dude Dundee goes to John Mayer. This is bound to take a while. Your body is a wonderland. Mayer wins this award after letting the show use Your Body is a Wonderland in the Benihana Christmas episode. On his blog, John wrote, One of my favorite shows on television, The Office, wanted to use my song Your Body is a Wonderland in a scene for their Christmas episode. Now, I'm not going to make apologies for my work, but it's safe to say I don't get asked to use Wonderland for strongman competitions and documentaries about aircraft carriers. I get asked so people can goof on it. I initially turned down the request, but after thinking about it and hearing the details of the incredibly funny sounding scene from producer BJ Novak, I decided to go for it, but with one stipulation. I won a Dundee. And they actually gave him a Dundee, which is really cool. So that's why it's meta. I'm giving you another Dundee. Anyway, so the second Dundee. I wouldn't feel right if I didn't do some sort of tribute to Harold Ramis. I'll spare the theatrics and not do an edit. I'll just speak to it. Like I said earlier, he had his hand in a ton of things that defined my childhood, just seemed like a stand-up guy, and also went to school in my hometown, just about 20 minutes away from where I live now. So I want to thank Harold Ramis for the years of entertainment. With that, let's get to the ratings. What gives what? What gives you the right? All right, so to answer your trivia question, what color or colors does Angela think is whorish? The answer is whatever color Phyllis is wearing. Red. How about green? I think green is kind of whorish. I thought you said green was whorish. No, orange is whorish. Okay, so for some ratings, I give this one a three out of five. I think it's a really strong cold opening, but it really just doesn't pack that much of a punch. Overall, it's just not very memorable. Case in point, as I'm writing this, I watched this episode yesterday. I had to go back and look up what this cold opening even was. It does its job as part of the episode, and Paul Lieberstein as Toby is just amazing. I don't care what anybody says. It's a good setup. It's just so melancholy along with the first half of this episode. And as for the actual episode, I rate this one a four out of five. I went back and forth on this and I couldn't decide if that was just too high. When I think about my favorite episodes, I doubt this is ever going to show up on my list without any prompting. But it is such a well done episode. Quote, it has it all is a thing I just keep hearing from people who talk about their favorite episodes of The Office. And while this episode has it all, I do think it suffers, as do most hour long episodes of The Office, of a runtime that's just a little bit too long. But regardless, it's got enough good bits going on to entertain throughout. But that's just what I think about the Benihana Christmas episode. What are your thoughts? What do you like or dislike from this one? What's an episode you were robbed of? What was the other thing I asked? Oh yeah, did you catch the multiple actress thing? Leave your thoughts in the comments. The discussion is part of the reason why I do this series, so I really do want to hear from you. With that, thanks for watching. I'll see you next week when we look at Back From Vacation. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.